so no matter at all okay i think we can ask uh, uh, mm rai sir to rotate the laptop just to get the view i think that like mm -hmm. just, just for the time mm -hmm. and that so you can rotate the laptop sir because we are not getting through uh, this thing I all right i'm trying for that please dr roy please rotate your laptop yeah I said that. <clears throat> Is it okay now? I think Dr. Pal sir will also be joining. Dr. Jain. Yeah. 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 Jain yeah. Pal, yeah. Sir, we are waiting for. We are waiting Pal for. Sir, him. Yeah. Jain Pal and, sir, yeah. Partho has joined. Our secretary, Dr. Partho Sarthi sir, Sarkar has joined. Welcome, Partho. Good evening, Partho. Sir. I think we can start here, uh, Siddharth. Sir, you open your PowerPoint first, then you start sharing, sir. That will be okay. Okay, I am one by leave Kursi. I am just leaving and yes, sir. Uh, you are rejoin, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, then it will be. I think that that would be. Siddharth, I think we can go live right now. Yeah, we will start. Partho has joined. Partho will tell uh, tell a welcome note. Siddharth, just let us know when we are live. I think it is uh, live on YouTube. YouTube, it's already oh. live on YouTube. So. All right, over to you, Partho. We can start our program with, with your welcome note. Welcome all. And it is my great pleasure that I today our guest faculty, Dr. J. Joseph, has consented for this WBA virtual PG class OSC based examination. And we are very much thankful to our expert panel, Professor M. M. Rai, Dr. Anirudh Sengupta, Dr. J. N. Pal, Dr. A. K. Pal, sir. And above all, we have our president, Professor Chinmoy Day, and our vice president, Dr. Kanchan Bhattacharya, and of course, our vice, uh, sorry, our uh, president elect, Dr. Kanchan Bhattacharya, and our vice president, Dr. Anirudh Sengupta, sir. And of course, our scientific committee chairman, Dr. Rajiv Raman and Sobhuti Shatta, they have done an immense job by organizing this type kind of uh, virtual class for our PG students because there are lots of conference we have, but this PG class is very much rare. So they are very much benefited with this kind of webinar. And I must uh, Welcome our moderator and officer Saha and our web coordinator Sikhar Gupta and Arnav Parmukar. I hope this will be a helpful webinar for all. And now, uh, one request to all our members that we have a upcoming our election also for IOA and I request our member to kindly vote. This will start from the 1st of the November. Thank you. Now over to Dr. Obisek Saha for continuation of this webinar. Thank you all. Abhishek, please introduce the faculty. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Dr. Sarka. It's, an, it's actually an honor to introduce my teacher and uh, one of my mentors, Dr. Jis Joseph Panaku. He uh, was my guiding light uh, during my postgraduate days. Uh, sir is an, uh, uh, sir has done his uh, MS ortho from uh, 
INS Ashwini, I believe. Sir uh, used to talk of very great times over there, including his uh, stories of uh, doing uh, uh, this <coughs> two thesis at that time. And uh, sir was attached with the Indian Navy for quite some time, where he honed his skills as uh, in uh, in the initial days as a young orthopedic surgeon. Then I think he joined our institution, the the Lissy Medical Institution, and uh, there he was with us uh, for some time. And after that, he has been working. Uh, he has been working in the EMC, the Ernakulam Medical Center, as a consultant arthroplasty surgeon. And uh, sir has a fellowship in arthroplasty and arthroscopy from uh, Hallium University in uh, South Korea, and he is also an AO fellow. So rather than still going into the details about uh, his, let us all be uh, uh, witness to uh, his excellent uh, lectures and his teaching, which I was fortunate enough uh, this, uh, uh, during my postgraduate days to be uh, witness to in that way. So over to you, sir. Just, just. Sir. Yeah. Uh, am I audible? Uh, shall I share the screen? Sir, yes, sir. Uh, first, we will have an introductory talk from M.M. Rai, sir, and uh, uh, about OSCE, sir, sir, will share. Sir, you want to share your screen, sir? Uh, yeah. Good evening. Can I am... Am I audible? Yes, yes sir. Audible. Am I audible? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Good evening, everybody, and uh, welcome to our speakers from outside also. And uh, this, uh, Oski, this is uh, Oski. I will few, uh, share with few uh, slides regarding Oski. Nowadays, this is a talk today, particularly for the uh, assessment system in both in uh, MS examination and uh, uh, DNB orthopedics examinations. That question has come particularly in this era because of the lack of clinical material. Because, you know, in the during exam, this is also a problem, probably Professor Jess will uh, agree that in the center, we don't get sufficient number of cases. Usually one or two, three cases will have to repeat and all, and we don't get such cases. So, this is one method, that is one particular problem. And particularly this COVID time, you know, these patients are not coming and in private hospital, the patients do not agree. They're not comfortable uh, to be examined by the uh, others. So they don't co cooperate. That's why this uh, OSCE or the objective structured clinical examination, that is very relevant nowadays. What is that? You know that uh, it has a lot of uh, advantages, is more reliable and valid assessment system and can be used to assess large number of students in short time and possible to use more junior examiners. Even junior examiners, they can be used and they can conduct this examination. And more, there are two systems that uh, it can be uh, conducted from the center uh, for example, DNB examination. From Delhi, they conducted, at the time, they uh, throw the question to all centers in the country, and the students will answer to that, and uh, uh, I'll show you. And it may be that in a particular center where the MS examination is being conducted, what is going on? You don't get any clinical examination. Your dummy patients are there, one or two patients or other clinical aspects like x-ray specimens or something is there. So different stations are there and some uh, questions are there. And uh, that's a checklist. And one examiner will be there. He, he has a checklist. And for each component, he has put, uh, put uh, some marks over there. So he will just uh, as observe whether the candidates are touching all these points or not. And according to that, they will mark them, mark the uh, particular question for questions. 
So these are this is the advantage. I'll show you. So here, what happens, you know, this clinical competence to be tested is broken down into various components, like taking history, how that history is taken, doing a particular test or interpretation of an X-ray or some test or like that or MRI and that to be tested and that can be done easily. Now, in uh, OSCE, the students rotate around 15 to 20 uh, stations, or it may be according to the need. But in DND examination, what they do, say last time, what probably you might be knowing that 50 uh, such questions were there. And uh, the students has to answer for that. And there's a, I mean, there is a fixed answer source also there. And that to be sent in, uh, in the, the daily and there are examiners, they will assess it. Here, in 15 or 20 uh, stations, the patients uh, in each station that might be patients or a normal person or a dummy patient, there might be some specimen or X-ray or a short history and questions or questions related to previous spots or anything which can evoke a question. And each spot will take about four to five minutes. The candidates will uh, uh, attend all the stations and examiners are there and they will assess it. And in the station, in each stations, there might be a procedure stations. In procedure stations, psychomotor skill of the candidate that can be tested. In question stations, the knowledge of the candidate in the particular uh, subject, particular subject, that can also be assessed. So knowledge of the subject, psychomotor skill, that can be tested by this procedure station and question stations. And in procedure stations, assessed by an examiner, I told you, having a checklist. He has got a set of uh, things that to be tested, whether the candidate has touched all these points or not. I'll give you an example. The checklist has fixed points for different subjects involved in the particular procedure. For an example, you see, suppose in one station, uh, it is written as record blood pressure of the patient. The assessor, a, maybe a senior examiner, junior examiner, he will, uh, he has a checklist. He will just observe whether that candidate has informed patient about the procedure he has taken it, the informed patient. Whether he is uh, uh, observing that position of the patient, how he has, candidate has done it or not. Position of the instrument, where he has kept the blood pressure instrument. Position of the doctor, where he stands. And how the, how the cough is applied, whether the check by palpatory method, check by auscultatory method, actual reading correct or not, student's attitude towards the patient. And each subhead, you see, marks are there, 0.5 marks, half marks, half marks, karke, it is about uh, five marks. So that uh, examiner will assess it. So that is a very scientific as well. Or a problem like this. Five-year male child brought with complaints of difficulty in walking and pain left hip. Gradual onset, antalgic gait, no history of trauma. Give differential diagnosis. The candidate will think over it and give, he will try to think. But a checklist is there with the examiner. He knows that uh, ideal answer should be transient synovitis, parthis disease, monoarticular rheumatoid, tuberculosis of the hip. And according to the uh, importance, the transient synovitis, it has been given two marks, parthis two marks, and uh, monoarticular rheumatoid or tuberculosis, 0 0.5 marks, 0 0.5 marks like that. Total five marks. So he, it will uh, be set beforehand. And that uh, demonstrate Thomas test in the subject. So checklist shows explanation uh, to an interaction with the patient, confirmation of the patient is on heartbeat, confirmation that pelvis is squared, flexion of the normal hip and knee to a maximum, insinuation of the hand below the lumbar spine to evaluate obliteration of lumbar lordosis, 
correct measurement of the deformity with goniometer after maximum extension of the affected hip with lumbar lordosis obliterated. So all these things have got to marks. Examiner will note it carefully and whether if the candidate does so, so he is very successful candidate. This can be practiced in MS exam or DR examiners and in the center. Or in DNB, it can be controlled, conducted centrally. From Delhi, uh, they throw these uh, questions to all over the all over the centers in the uh, examination center, practical examination center. Be it in the north, be it in the south, in the east or west, what wherever it may be, even in uh, abroad. So they will throw like this a picture like this. What is this deformity? What is the commonest cause? What are the expected palpatory finding? Supra uh, 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 finding if supracondylar is uh, palpatory, uh, it is due to the trauma. Which movement of the shoulder is likely to be restricted? Is the deformity progressive? At what age it should be corrected? Like this, different questions. The in this uh, system, what DNB is doing now? Centrally, they uh, send the questions and candidates are in the practical uh, hall, examination hall, and observers are there. They will be given a sheet of uh, answer sheet. They will write the, put the question uh, number and the answers, and that will be sent by scanning. And after that, they will associate. So this is the system where you no need of clinical material, only uh, dummy patients or like that, that can be practiced. But thing is that uh, it is very demanding because preparation of such questions is demanding really. The examiners will have to work hard. That is the only thing is that, and uh, everybody at the orientation, our object is that orientation of such exam things that uh, that might be the questions, uh, that might be the way of answering. This is the importance. Thank you very much with this. Uh, I hope the main uh, subject the, or the speaker is the, you will enjoy and the others are there. Now uh, I'm uh, answering. Yes, I have answered your question. So thank you, sir, for wonderful okay. talk. Okay, okay, thank you. And now we would like to invite our a uh, few words from A.K. Pal, sir. Sir, A.K. Pal, sir. So A.K. Pal, sir, is a very senior. He is also DNB examiner from our our state. And he has conducted his, he, uh, the IPG conducts the DNB examination every year, once or twice in a year. So regarding the system, yes, sir. Yes, just I want to share that uh, just uh, according to the uh, in, MCI, just has confirmed to NM, uh, NMC. So the, the actually the whole uh, the schedule of the undergraduate teaching has become changed, undergraduate and postgraduate uh, training. And they actually, they, uh, the huge uh, difference <clears throat> has become imposed to uh, in inculcate uh, the, especially the attitude, not only the, the uh, skill and the knowledge, but also the attitude of the student is also assessed. And at the end of this uh, training, they actually, they term that, uh, the, 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 the term the, actually the coin is the uh, Indian medical graduate instead of the Indian medical practitioner. Now all the MBBS students will become the Indian medical graduate. And for that, they have made the Miller's pyramid. The Miller's pyramid that indicates that uh, they are just uh, uh, the previous uh, ways of teaching and assessment that is for the written examination and also the MCQ. They actually assess the knowledge component, but the actual, the exact amount of competency, competency and the skill cannot be assessed with this knowledge. So that is why the whole uh, the training has become changed into the competency based medical education. This is known as a competency based medical education where the whole of the, the, uh, the knowledge as also the skill and also the the, the, uh, the affective that is the behavior and attitude of the uh, the patients towards the, the to, towards the patients uh, students or the stu uh, patients the attitude skill and the knowledge whole uh, overall 
every every aspect should be assessed and the oski and the osp there is a there is objective structured clinical examination and objective structured practical examination these are the most informative and very much standardized tool step very much standardized tool for, uh, for all the uh, examiners and also for the students also so for the assessment so this is the only way this is not the new one this is actually started from 1975 from under city and ultimately it is actually co-opted from different uh, countries now this is the uh, high time to be co-opted for the, our countries also in the covid scenario so this is the way by which we can assess of the all the three categories the, the knowledge skill as also the the, the, uh, the attitude to endure the patients which is most important in clinical scenario so because most of the cases where you can see the litigations are because of the lack of attitude of the students from the, for the, for the patient so the uh, in addition to primary which is highlighted so the, the this is also this attitude component also can be added with the help of some uh, specific uh, or making a simulated patients simulated patients which can uh, uh, cite some specific problem to the um, students and the examiners is actually silent observer that will come silent observer with a with a score card so there's a specific questions whether they is asking so how much information they have the students can gather from the ailing uh, simulated patient this is the uh, subject of choice and how how far they are very much sympathetic and how far sympathetic enough if the diagnosis is can is possible to make a diagnosis how is uh, uh, his uh, this uh, break out the bad news as also how it uh, narrated the plan and the complications to the patients this is also very much important that can also be uh, this got uh, access with this oski and ospi system so with this what i think without any delay we are very much uh, uh, keen to uh, know the the actual expert comments of uh, dr jis so thank you thank you all welcome dr Over. jis our guest faculty today and uh, we would like invite you to share your screen Uh, am I audible? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Can you see my screen? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, first of all, uh, I would like to thank the office bearers of West Bengal Orthopedic Association for giving me an opportunity to be with you all in this fine evening. I'd like to thank especially Dr. Rajiv and uh, uh, Dr. Abhishek who are there with me in Kochi. So I'm glad to see him again after such a long time. Uh, and i thought that it will be uh, more beneficial to the post graduates as uh, raisa and palsa have said because the ost is the examination way for the students in the corona pandemic situation and it is the way most of the countries have adopted so i have divided my allotted time to two parts in the first part i would like to share uh, three or four osts and in the second part uh, a small uh, discussion about how you fix the osteoporotic fractures so without much uh, delay i would like to move on to the first uh, osc so can you see uh, an mri film everybody so i have heard that gunjan is a fine year student anybody else so any student like to take this question so here you can see two arrows so one arrow depicting a tear in the meniscus and one arrow showing extra vascularization of fluid so anybody like to take this question identify the lesion the theory of origin what is the sani sign and how will you manage this lesion Anybody like to this? Yeah, Anil, you can take this question. Postgraduate oh, students, sir, please. please MRI. Uh, sir, please, please, MRI, sir. Yeah. So you can start saying that uh, MRI image, coronal, patch, axial. So this looks like more of a coronal image. Okay. Yes, sir. So what else exactly you see there? Sir, uh, MRI, please, sir. Still questions are there on the screen, sir. <clears throat> sir this is a coronal uh, image of the knee joint sir uh, showing a tear in the lateral meniscus sir with some 
effusion in the knee joint, sir? Uh, is it uh, an effusion inside the knee joint, or is it like more extra versatile outside? Sir, extra versatile versatile outside the knee joint, sir. Between yeah, so, the LCL and the meniscus, sir. Yeah. So, what's your probable? You want to go back to the question? Yes, what sir. is the lesion? Sir, this is a tear, a little meniscus tear, sir. Okay. So, theories of origin, it can be uh, mostly traumatic, sir. Okay. And uh, so, Pisani sign never heard of, sir. Okay. Uh, management, sir, our diagnosis, sir, uh, arthroscopically, we can see it. And uh, depending upon where it, uh, it is exactly located, we can plan whether we have to reset it, debride it, or whether we have to repair it, sir. Okay, very good. So, Thank you, you have correctly identified, Anil. Uh, Dr. Anil, you have identified. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, that is the minister. But the diagnosis should have been better, you say it as a meniscal cyst. It's meniscal cyst, yes. Yeah, so most of the time a meniscal cyst is followed by a tear in the meniscus. And depending upon the size, it can be a very or a small fluid lesions are seen within the meniscus. So it can be seen on the lateral side. So in the lateral side, you normally see it around the anterior horn or the mid portion. Or it can be seen on the medial side. In this aspect, you see it mainly around the posterior horn. So don't confuse this perimeniscal cyst with a paramenstrual cyst. A popliteal cyst or a baker cyst is more of a paramenstrual cyst where the fluid has extravasated much away from the meniscus. So a paramenstrual cyst or a popliteal cyst is located between the belly of semimembranous and as well as the head of middle head of gastro. So identifying a meniscus is good, but you should have said that answer is a meniscal cyst. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah. Yes, sir. So that's, yeah. So next we'll move on to the theory that we have widely identified. Trauma is the major cause causing the mucoid degeneration. Other causes can be degeneration with the age, or it can be because of inclusion of synovial cells within the meniscus as a development, or later on as an actuate where the synovial cells get entrapped into the meniscus. But I have uh, to assure you that, okay, when you see a popliteal cyst, it is not literally a meniscal cyst. We see the meniscal cyst, but it is more of a perimeniscal cyst. Yes, sir. Okay? Yeah, epiphany sign. This has been described uh, early in the century. When you see a meniscal cyst, they are characteristically more prominent when the knee is extended. And it is less prominent when the knee is flexed. And this is more important when the cyst is much smaller. If it's a large cyst, it will be present even if it is in flexion as well as extension. But a small cyst, when it gets flexed, it becomes disappeared. And that is a Tiffany sign. It's described by Dr. Tiffany. Yes, so sir. the next part, the treatment. <coughs> so most of these meniscal cysts uh, definitely need surgery and rarely conservative treatments like injections and the inflammatory medications. And this gives you only a temporary cure. As you have rightly said, you have to do an arthroscopic detachment, depending upon what the type of tear. If it is repairable, you can do a repair, but you have to do the decompression of the cyst as well. So when you decompress the cyst, especially in a popliteal cyst, you can identify some, some, some something like a valvular fold in the posteromedial aspect. So try to debride it so that a one-way tract becomes a two-way tract. So later on, the cyst collapses by itself. You don't need to really excise the cyst as well. Once it becomes a two-way tract, it collapses. You need to do some compression bandage. Later on, the cyst will disappear. Okay, so we'll yes, move sir. on to the next question. Okay? <coughs> yes, sir. Uh, yeah, I, I, do you want me to be a bit slow or I just it's, pretty fine? Sir, it's okay, sir. It's okay. Speed okay. is fine, we'll sir. Move on to so the second spot of, in the OC. You can identify a device. Is there anybody else other than Anil? It will be too much for him to take all Anil, the questions. Yeah. Sotrik, you can join. Sotrik. Sotrik, open your video. Uh, good evening, sir. Yeah, good evening. Sotrik, yeah. Yes, sir. You can take a spot or two. Dr. Sotrik Mukherjee is there from North Bengal Media College, Siliguri. Yeah. Uh, 
This is a foot and ankle orthosis, sir. Flo uh, floor, it's a floor reaction orthosis. Floor reaction. So yeah. you want to say it's a floor reaction orthosis. So that uh, we'll come to the questions which is, which can be asked. So first is the identification. You have identified it as a flow reaction orthosis. What are the parts? What are the parts of this device orthosis? That's the second part of the question. Patrick, what are the parts sir is asking? Yeah. It's okay. You can say, I don't know. Then uh, we can speak so, to somebody else. Yeah. Yeah. The aim is to teach you guys, no, this is not to take your answers. So it's okay. You yeah. can say, if you don't know, you can skip it. No problem. Or Anil can take the uh, this thing also and that over there. He can also join in, in between. Yeah. yeah. Uh, sir, I don't know the part, sir. Okay. What is the working principle? Uh, I don't know. Sir. Okay. Okay. It's pretty fine. <coughs> so as uh, he has it identified, is it is uh, orthosis. So when you see such a device as a postgraduate student, what is your first aim is to identify whether it is a prosthesis or an orthosis. So the easy way is that a prosthesis resembles a body part that is used to replace the part of the body missing. So it will be a shape of a hand, the shape of a foot or anything because it's a prosthesis. It has to resemble the missing body part. But orthosis are devices which used to correct enhance the body part. So it will not look like a body part, but it looks like a thing which can wrap around the body part. So if anybody Post doesn't pieces. know about this also can identify, this looks like a wrap around, around the leg. So if you can identify it is an orthosis and it is an orthosis which is applied to the lower leg. So sometimes you may not be knowing all the orthosis. So you can easily identify. So you have scored one mark. Okay, you have identified it as an orthosis. And second, you are saying it is a orthosis of the lower limb, okay, or around the leg. Now, you have two things which look similar. One is a foot drop splint and one is a PTB. Floor. Yeah, so how you can distinguish between these? So in a foot drop splint, it doesn't have a knee pad. So what you see here is a knee piece, okay? The foot drop splint normally doesn't come up to the knee level. The foot drop splint normally have a strap in the front, but it is not to support the knee joint. It will be much below than that of the flow reaction orthosis. But the flow reaction orthosis has to be bracing on the knee joint so that a reaction normally goes up. So this is used when you have a weak quadriceps. Okay? So it has got three parts. It has got a foot plate, it has got an upright, and a knee piece. So on comparison with a uh, foot drop splint, what the difference is basically is a difference of knee piece. Is it clear, Anil? Yes, sir. Okay. So yes, what, sir. What happens when you wear a flow reaction orthosis? So the working principle is Newton's law. Every action has got an equal and opposite reaction. So this process, this orthosis keeps the forefoot contact the ground in the early stand. So instead of Touching the heel, the forefoot contacts the ground. And in the mid stance, the body weight brings the heel down. And this extension moment imparts a force on the knee piece and pushes the knee backwards. Something like this. Is it clear? So, yes, in equivalence, so this is transmitted to the knee and this pushes the orthosis, the knee backwards. Is it clear? So you should not make a mistake. It's a little tricky when you see in an exam whether it is a foot drop splint or a flow reaction orthosis, look for the knee piece. Is it clear, Anil? Yes, sir. Okay, we'll move on to the next photo. Yes, sir. Okay, so it's a simple test. So what you are seeing here is a test question. So I tried to uh, split up as uh, Dr. Palsar has said. So identify the test, name the nerve being tested, Name the muscle being tested. Mention any other test for the nerve. And if you feel whether the test can be done in a better way. So this is a card test, sir. Okay. Uh, tested uh, for the median nerve, sir. No, no, no. 
No, let him answer. I'm sure. Okay, okay, okay. It's okay. It's okay. Sorry, sorry, it's sorry. Based, no, no, it's not a matter of sorry. No, no, no point. No, you see, you can make a mistake now so that you won't make a mistake later on. So it's not a question like that. You have to answer everything correctly. No. So many of the postgraduates, when they begin with their career, they all make mistakes. So that's the reason these sessions. I'm very really happy to know that the Bengal Orthopedic Association is taking such a good initiative. Sanjay, so don't get uh, clumsy with this. You can answer whatever you feel. It doesn't matter. So you'll be confident to say that's okay. That's all matter. But try to think and correctly answer it. Okay. So this is a car test, sir. We okay, doing... perfect, perfect. Uh, so we are testing it for the ulna now, sir. Okay. Muscle okay. test is, is lumbrical, sir. Okay. Another uh, test is. Disagree? Anybody disagree with it? Any other postgraduate? So, sir, interosseous. Sorry, interosseous. We are testing, sir. Adduction. Yeah, it's okay. It's okay. Yeah. So lumbricus. Uh, it's mainly a uh, writing position. That's what the purpose of lumbricus. You need the flexion of the metacarpophalangeal joint and extension of the interphalangeal joint. But in Roche, it can be a farmer or and dorsal. dorsal. Okay, so the in are normally tested with this sort of a carcer. Okay, so any other test for Alnana? Or uh, sir, Igawa test. Okay, very good. How you do that? Can you show it in the screen? Uh, sir, uh, we ask the patient to move the finger, hand like this, and uh, ask the patient to move the finger apart, sir. Can you bring it up to your face level so that we can see? Yeah, sir, ah, okay, okay, yeah. Yes. Sir, put yeah. the hand like this and ask the patient to move the fingers apart, sir. Uh, not exactly, yeah, yeah, uh, but it's uh, fingers alone, but not exactly the way you have shown. Igawa test means it's more of a dancing finger, okay. So you have to raise the finger above and you have yes. to bring it. So you are seeing. So I'll show you. You can see this is more of a Igawa test. Is it clear now? Yes, okay. sir. Yeah. So before I move further, there is a trick in this uh, muscles tested for card test. So which in Roche are tested during card test? Uh, uh, sir, Palmer interosseous. Okay, why you said so? Sir, Palmer interosseous, they cause adduction. Adduction, very good. So, when you are checking uh, literally a carcass, you are actually keeping a card between the fingers, where the adduction of the fingers helps you to hold the hand card very well. Okay, but there are some examiners, I have come across such an examiner who feels adduction of finger alone will not help you to grip the card. Okay, so the abduction of the adjacent fingers also needed to grip finally. But in some textbooks, it is only written palmar in Roche. So I suggest you, you say in Roche. And to start with, if somebody asks you which in Roche, then he specifically wants palmar in Roche. You say that. So you got the card. So I just want to share my experience because I don't want you to get into that side. So always say yes, in Roche. We specifically ask for, then you say, Palmar in Roche. So uh, I'd like to hear the comments from Parsa or anybody who's uh, seniors here. They'd like to say something about it. Okay. Dr. Rai, sir. Hello. Yeah, Dr. Rai. The... Hello? Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, so uh, we will move on to the last part of the question. So what has been shown here, is it correct? Or is it a better way of doing it? So, sir, I think it's correct, sir. Because exactly. we have we have done it like this only. Yeah, yeah. so this is another trick in this question. There are some people, <coughs> like when you are doing a book test, you have to, the examiner oh, also no. have to hold it in the opposite hand. So here you are checking the power of the intro shape. So some examiners insist that the examiner also should keep in between the fingers. But I, I won't say this is right or wrong because it's not a matter of, this is to groom you for the post. Okay, so it is, nobody is going to say that you are wrong if you are keeping it between your fingers. But some examiners may disagree. So when you frame the answers, we have to be very careful. So that's why I just put this question and clarify all this. So 
uh, it's clear that test yes, is sir. the test. Okay. And uh, now tested is Alana. Okay. And the muscles are in Roche, Pharma in Roche. And the other two tests we have said one is in Gava. What is the second test? Two tests for Alana. So we have already said about the carter. We have said about the Gava. Yes, sir. Uh, anybody? Sir. A third test? So from it sign. Yeah, very good. So what is the from it sign? So don't remember, sir. Okay. So I will <coughs> show you. See, if you see, most of the muscles of the hypothenar eminence is supplied by Alana. But very few muscles of the thenar eminence is supplied by Alana. So the most important muscle of the thenar eminence is... Exactly. So when you are <coughs> doing a book test, what are you doing is checking the adduction of the thumb, so which is supplied by the alana. But no patient is like to show their inability. So when they are unable to grip with their adduction of the thumb, what they try to do is by flexing the interphalangeal joint, they try to grab on the book. So that is what is a prominent side. Exactly. So here you can see the reflection of the interphalangeal joint. But Anil and the rest of the postgraduates do remember when you're doing a book test, the examiner has to hold it in between the thumb and the yes, sir. exactly the same. But Carter, I won't say that it is a must, but there are some examiners who insist that it has to be between your finger and that. Okay? Uh, initially, I thought that I will have only OC, then later on, uh, I got an idea that okay, it is going to be uh, YouTube, so there won't be any chance to interact. So I made a talk after this. So shall I move on to the talk now? Talk yes, sir. Talk yes, sir. Sure, sir. Sure, sir. Yeah. So this also, uh, uh, I think uh, it will be interesting for you. Uh, good to know about how you fix about an osteoporotic factor. So the learning objective of this session is to understand the difference in the structure between an osteoporotic bone and a normal bone. The interaction of osteoporotic bone and the various types of implants what we currently use, the various types of fixation devices which helps to fix this osteoporotic bone and few tips to avoid complications. So as the age advances, you can see the thickness of the cortex of the bone reduces down. But how the nature compensates? The nature compensates it by increasing the radius. So if you compare the thickness of an osteoporotic bone, you can see the thickness is much less than that of a young bone. But the radius is increased. So an increase in radius is nature's way of protecting the strength of the osteoporotic bone. Because the torsional strength is radius raised to the power of 4. Okay, so this happens with the osteoporotic bone. But when there is a loss of thickness, the working length of the implant, which is basically the screws, reduces in massive. So it can easily cut out. Okay, so it will become more or less like an extra. Similar changes happen in the cancellous bone as well, where the bony trabecular becomes thinner and fewer and with few broken interconnections. So the AO principles, I am a co-founder of AO, I am being uh, into a faculty, so most of the things I am sharing with you is based upon AO's philosophy. The AO principles of factor fixation remains valid even for osteoporotic bone fixation, but it differs a slight manner other than fixing up a normal bone. So when you want to fix an osteoporotic bone, you are not looking for absolute fixation. What you are looking for is a relative reduction with good alignment and rotation. But sometimes you don't want to do multiple attempts of reduction in an osteoporotic bone. If you try to keep doing the reduction again and again, the bone becomes so soft and you will have a lot of complications. So sometimes you have to accept the reduction what you've got. So you can have two types of acceptance. 
either you can have a valgus reduction or a varus reduction, especially in a proximal humerus or a proximal femur. So sometimes you may not have a good reduction. Sometimes you can have a valgus reduction or a varus reduction in a proximal humerus or a proximal femur. And if you want to accept the reduction, it is better to go for a valgus reduction in osteoporotic form. It is always good to have a perfect reduction, but a valgus is more forgiving than that. So let's see a few cases. So this is a case of proximal femur, which has been fixed with one of the best implant available now, that is PSNA2. But what is lacking in here? What is lacking here? Uh, sir, here, uh, posterior medial uh, sta uh, stability is not there, sir, here. Yeah. So what is lacking here is there is no reduction. So yes, it's sir. not giving you good stability. So it's not your implant position. Here you can see the screw is all in the center, center in the good position. The Deep implant way. is good, but what is lacking? A good reduction. And this has failed. And sometimes your aim is to get a good line. So when you, you have been taught that whenever you have to fix a bone, it has to be with a good length. Okay, getting a proper length is a prerequisite. But in osteoporotic bone, you need to differentiate. So let's see another case. So this is a case of proximal femur, which has been fixed with one of the stages implants, that is BCS. But what is there? There is a big void there. There was no attempt to compensate for the void and this has failed subsequently. So in osteoporotic bone, it's not like that we always go for, uh, you don't care about the line, but in an osteoporotic bone, it is always good to impact in the bone, especially in a proximal femur or proximal humerus, a bit of impaction. You are not really worried about the length in an elderly patient. What you are more worried about is getting a good healing. Okay, so you don't want too much complication. So especially in the proximal humor, you are not at all worried about the line. So it's good to do a bit of impaction and have a good stability than trying to get a good line by keeping a void. So a shortening of metaphysis by impaction is quite acceptable when you treat uh -huh. an osteoporotic bone. Okay? Yes, sir. So what we have been taught uh, is that if you have a simple fracture, you need to have an absolute stability, and the absolute stability is best given by a lag screw. And how you put a lag screw? Normally, you over drill and you put a screw across the fracture and you tighten it up. And the near cortex is normally over drilled. But when you try to put a lag screw in an osteoporotic bone, even in a simple fracture, the bone quality is so bad. So when you tighten it to some extent, the bone starts breaking. So in an osteoporotic bone, even in a simple fracture, it is good to achieve secondary fracture healing. Don't try to put any lax screw in because the bone quality is bad. So one of the prerequisites for a lax screw is that the bone fracture has to be a simple fracture and there has to be sufficient bone quality. Okay? But yes, having said this, we should not mix up the principle. We cannot have a lag screw and put an absolute stability or without lag screw and we say we are going for a bridge plating and relative stability. So let's see another case. So this is a case of distal femur. It has been fixed with a nice implant lock plate. But what the surgeon tried to do is, although the fracture reduction is not really good, they tried to put a lag screw there and the fracture failed to consolidate even after a few months. So when it is realized that it is a mixing up of principles, there is a bridge plating and you have a lag screw there. There is no carrot. So what the surgeon has done is that he removed the screw, the lag screw from that area, taken out few screws from the adjacent area, make it a more elastic fixation of relative stability and the fracture has consolidated very well. So when you try to fix up any fracture, you have to decide this is a relative stability, I want to do a bridge plating, or this is a fixation by absolute stability by lag screw or compression plate. Is it clear? Yes, okay. sir. Yeah. So implants do play a very major role in osteoporotic fracture fixation. And what is the most important characteristic we like to look for is angular stability. 
So angular stability is a common implant what we commonly use is a lock screen. Can anybody say uh, what are the other implants with angular stability? Any other implants? <coughs> Anybody? So lock plate is one of the common one which gives you angular stability when the head of the screw locks to the thread of the plate. Now the angular stable uh, locking uh, locking bolt is also available along with okay. the interlocking nail. Yeah, that's uh, that. So you you can even use a nail with a lock principle. Okay. Yeah. So is there any any other any other implants you know about? And also variable angle uh, plate also there is a yeah. very radius for radius. Yeah, perfect, perfect. So you have a variable angle. So when I'm saying it's an uh, angular stability, it doesn't mean that it has to be a nail with the lock screws or a plate with everything. Your BCS is an angular stable implant. It is 95 degrees fixed. You understand what I'm saying, Anil? Yes, sir. Yeah, so the angle is fixed. It's predetermined. It won't allow that to change. So that is an angular stability. And uh, Dr. Palsar has said, now you have this sort of a screws there. So even a relative stability fixation with a nail can be made to a lock stability. Then you have this sort of threading in the screws. So that's what Palsar was saying. Okay. Yeah, so the sleeve, sleeve inside that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Perfect. So what is the advantage when you use such a construct, when you use a lock plate? The most problem with uh, screw tightening in osteoporosis is that you rip the thread down. When you try to over tight, when you try to use a bit of more force, the <clears> thread <throat> gets ripped and the screw becomes loose. But when you are using a locking head screw, the screws cannot be over tightened because it tightens in the plate. It won't give you compression in the bone. And it can withstand higher resistance of bending forces. And there is no chance of secondary screw loosening. So what do you mean by secondary screw loosening? When you make a reduction and fixation of an implant with a bone, immediately during surgery, the screw can come off. Okay, so that is primary screw loosening. A secondary screw loosening because of the wear and tear, because of the toggle, later on the implant, the screws back off. So that is what is a secondary screw loosening. As these screws are tightened in the plate, it cannot back off. So there is less chance of secondary screw loosening in case of a lock plate. And another problem when you want to do a MIPO is that the plate has to be perfectly cone tooled. But if you are using a lock plate, as the screws are not going to touch the bone, even if it is a little far off, it can be still used for a MIPO procedure. So having a lock plate, another because in a osteoporotic bone, you try to do most of the surgeries in a minimum invasive manner because the bone regeneration capacity is very less. We want to keep the biology asset. So lock plate always helps you to tackle this issue when you have a minimal invasive procedure. Okay, so this is a graph which shows the pull out strength of various screws. So you can see this is a, what type of screw are you? Sir, cortical screw, sir. Yeah, it's more of a cortical screw. It's a conventional 4.5 screw. And you can see it has got a withstanding strength of 200. But if you see, even I am putting a lock screw of 4 mm cortical, and even if it is more cortical, it has got a better pull out strength, almost 17% more than that of the cortical screw. Conventional so this screw. is a smaller size screw, and it is more cortical, but still has got a better pull out strength. But if you place this screw by cortical, the pull out strength from 17% it increases to 82 80%. 80 yeah. So that is a big leap. So let's see this with a case scenario. Here, this is a case of distal femur, and this is published, I've taken it from the AO library. So early days, it was advocated that you should use the monocortical screws with lock screws. And this is a lift plating. So you have three determined screw levels, and you have done it. And you know, during the surgery, the next day itself, the implant failed. So the surgeon and the team have realized that this is failed because the screw strength, the pull-out strength is much less. It's a, it's a lock plate, it's one of the best plates, but the screws are placed monocortic. So what they have done, they just revised Bicortical. It. They made it bicortical and the fracture has unite. Okay, so this gives you the importance. So a screw has to be bicortical, always, always bicortical when you are fixing it in that osteoporotic. 
and it is preferable to use large size screws. It's preferable to use a uh, locking screws when you are fixing up a osteoporotic bone. And when you are fixing, here you can see the plate is a little short because we have another implant. But when you are fixing up any osteoporotic bone, try to use the long plate possible because it gives you such a splintage. Because a periprosthetic fracture and the relative stability, these two needs most of the time a longer implant protection. Longer work. Yeah, perfect. So a long bridge with a long plate always is preferable because it gives you a good splinting. I think there is some network issue network with... issues. In the meantime, A.K. Paul, sir, sir uh, would you like to in, in, uh, enlighten the residents with uh, yeah. osteoporosis and fracture fixation? Some yeah, point from you on World Osteoporosis Day, sir. Yeah, actually, uh, yes. <clears throat> actually, um, so uh, see, this is the, the, the bicortical screw fixation. So bicortical screw fixation is always a, important to, in, to adequately maintain the working length of the screw. So, what is the actual the working length of the screw? Working length of the screw is, is the it is the outer it is the distance of the length of the screw which is in contact with the uh, cortical bone. So, mm -hmm. cortical contact from outer cortex to inner uh, near cortex to far cortex it is the length of the screw which is in, actually is unsupported. That is the working length. So, in case of osteoporotic bone, as the bones are cortical thickness is much less, so working length of the screw is much more. So that is the you know, osteoporotic bone is the working length is much more. So stability is relatively less. So that is the most important. And that is why the angular stability is much more important for the what do you mean by the angular stability? What is the basic difference between the, the normal plate and the locking plate? Normal plate actually how the longer plate actually normal plate actually acts. It acts by the friction system. It acts by the friction system between the bone and the plate. So, um, so, so that it should be intimately in contact with the bone. So that is that friction that maintains that uh, the stability. But for the angular stable system, it doesn't require the actual uh, adequate contouring of the plate or adequate contact of the plate with the bone. So the plate may be placed away, much more away from the bone, away, away from the outside the periosteum. So periosteal uh, blood supply is uh, maintained. So in that case, so so this angular stability, once the, 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 the force is coming from proximal to distal, the, the actual uh, load that is distributed to all the screw threads. So no single, no individual screw thread is, is, is really responsible for actually being the whole thread. And as the, 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 uh, the walking length is much more in case of uh, osteoporotic bone, it, it should be angular stable. No micro motion should be allowed at this screw plate junction. At the, on the contrary, the micromotion should be allowed at the fracture site. That is why, so in osteoporotic bone, the principles of fixation is, is the use of the angle stable uh, implant. That is one. Second one, so you have to uh, increase, you have to, uh, uh, the plate span ratio. What is plate, plate span ratio? Plate span ratio is the, the, the depending on the fracture and the length of the plate, depending on the fracture zone. So if the fracture, uh, ideally the fracture zone, if it is, uh, uh, suppose it is a three centimeter, the plate should be at least three times. That is at least three times. That is nine centimeter plate should be used. And the plate span ratio is number of the screws divided by total number of screw holes. So it should be at least less than 0 0.3. That means at least three or four uh, screw holes should be left open across the fracture. This is most important to increase the micro motion at the fracture side. Do you understand? That is the most important. I, I, I think the, the Dr. G is uh, a please, please continue, sir. Yeah, yeah. Sorry for the, the problem with the network. Okay, I'll share the slide again. Yeah. We are discussing about the plate span ratio. Yeah, yeah, I heard that, sir. Thank you, thank you for intervening in between. So, so you should always. Try to avoid this sort of a heterogenic fracture because uh, when you have this sort of an implant on top and another implant below, the intervening bone cannot withstand. Even in a normal person, this will cause to fractures later on. So always try to. For example, 
uh, when you mm. have a humerus pillows done for the proximal humerus and you have a fractured below when you are putting up a plate at least put one screw or two screws so there is a uh, in, uh, a area of overlap so that this sort of an impedance factor will not happen okay so this is a diagram which uh, shows that uh, how much is the strength so if you have a plate only up to here the strength is only around 6000 but if you have the plate going higher up there is a chance of overlap you can see that which standing for is much more it comes up to 8000 that's the point i have to say so when you try to fix up this uh, osteoporotic bone the bone is pretty weak but try to get hold of the best position in a femoral head as uh, already indicated by dr bom gartner the center center is the best position for your screw hole so when you try to place either a dhs or any helical blade try to get hold of the center center position so where you have the best bone position so this is not only in ap as well as lateral view and second thing is that you have an option of different types of implants try to get the implant this maximum surface area so instead of a screw sometimes it is good to use a helical blade because the surface area is much more so because there is more bone implant in that case a screw and a helical blade i will definitely prefer a helical blade in case of an osteoporotic bone because there is more purchase and there is better strength and i have already highlighted because of the lock plate you know in a osteoporotic bone the regenerating potential is pretty low so we want to keep the balance so always look for minimal invasive procedure and achieve the reduction by indirect means than open up because you may have a perfect x ray that's not what you want you want your patient to be walking for that you need the fracture to be united well for that it is a prerequisite to do a minimal invasive procedure so when you have because of lot of uh, replacements happening all around now we are going i'm sure that the new generation is going to see a lot of very prosthetic fractures because you have a tkr done you have a any arthroplasty or a dhr done it's going to break below or at the side and what is the implant we normally use because of lack of fixation you normally rely upon the anchor plate the advantage of having a anchor plate is that it doesn't need an intrusive anchor plate and it is independent of the local bone quality and the force transmission is runs centripetally to the loop fixing radially displaced fragments but the disadvantage is that it cannot withstand any axial or torsional force so if you have an option of putting a screw even monocortical it is much preferred than having a surface but sometimes you will not be able to have a plate position in such a way that you will be having a screw over there but if you compare a screw with a surface a screw is always preferred even if it is monocortical but the advantage of surface is you don't have anything else to fix on that surface helps to fix it very well so here you can see a, a periprosthetic fracture of the femur which has been fixed with a very long plate try to use a very long plate otherwise you know later on there will be a fracture much below than that so when you using a surface you have two options either you can go for a cable or you can just go for an axial strike so more contact area helps you better fix it so a cable is definitely going to give you a better fixation when you are using a surface in an osteoporotic bone and always try to use a thicker one here you can see now as the size of the cable increases you know the strength also increases remarkably but sometimes you may not be having all the facilities for a cable so it is okay if you loop the accessory twice it gives you a better strength than a looping a single time so that is one way you can do it and you know most of the time the tension or the circulation become loose and when you start twisting so if you have an option of crimping in an osteoporotic bone especially always try to prefer crimping than twisting and in a new twist as a postgraduate i am sure that most of the time your professors will give you the chance to twist and bend it so do remember how you should fix it so and which one you will prefer a b c and d very common thing you do so we have done uh, a once so we have done a 
okay so which one do you feel uh, is the best way of doing so d okay so when you do of d you can see the twist of the wire can you see the twist of the wire yes sir i can see you over here ah uh, your bending should be opposing to that because most of the time when you bend then keep the wire close to the bone that the time you do the fixation strength the loop strength so this is more preferable d is more preferable when you do c it loosens up okay so this yes, is a small technique that i thought as a reason i thought that when you do an ensemble place try to bend your wire somewhat like this okay that is give you better hold of the bone and when i say that osteoporotic factor when you have different options of fixing up this elderly people always try to give a fixation device which makes them walk early if you have an unstable fracture of proximal femur if you put a dhs it may unite but you need to wait for many days many months before it consolidates but if you put a nail in although the fixation and other things will be almost easy or different depending on the technique but you can early mobilize this patient if you have an option of doing a replacement without other thing you should try to do that if your fixation is not going to give them good stability in near future so if you have multiple options in an osteoporotic bone always choose the fixation device which permits early mobility having said this these elderly people cannot do partial weight bearing either they walk with full weight or they don't walk so don't expect them like a young man you put only 10 kg weight or 15 kg it's not possible for them so when you allow them to weigh there it is full weight bearing so your fixation should be strong enough to withstand that sometimes you need to augment it so there are a lot of papers coming up from camera land when your fixation device is good but your bone quality is so bad and sometimes your fixation position is not good you can augment it with cement so this is something you can think about in an osteoporotic bone augmentation with cement not only in proximal humerus proximal femur all those places a lot of work has been happening so i would like to conclude my talk by giving you few take home messages age affects the bone the risk a reduction in the thickness of the cortex but there is an increase in the radius when you have a diaphyseal fracture you think about relative stability and try to splint it with very long implants when you have a metaphyseal fracture it's good to do a bit of impaction you are not really worried about the length it's good to use uh, implant with a large surface area like blade it's good to use a lock blade because it give you angular stability so this uh, i come to the end of my discussion about osteoporotic fracture i'd like to take some questions thank you sir thank you sir thank you sir yeah. uh dr pal sir would you like to add uh, something to our uh, to... it is excellently that is described uh, so just if we conclude that is is oski and ospi this is most important uh, uh, tools and uh, this is also this is student friendly students and teacher friendly so that this is very very it is a very uh, standardized technique so the everything everybody is, is open to all so it is very uh, standardized and it is uh, open to all and very easy for the student and, and also teachers so i think this is the actual the future of our uh, system education system and the assessment so that uh, we can easily evaluate our the skills knowledge and the attitude of the students and the most important i already told the attitude is the most important which you have to learn uh our selves as also we have to teach our uh, students uh, for, uh, for the uh, future avoidance of the litigations so this is most important next one is the uh, osteoporotic fractures uh, dr g is uh, excellent uh, de excellent to deliver at the fixation principles of the osteoporotic fractures uh, what is the basic difference between the fixation of the osteoporotic fractures from the normal uh, bony architecture and uh, what are the precautions to be taken during the and especially the the angular stability in concentration of the ang angular stability which is must uh, most important for the fixation in the osteoporotic bones as also to maintain if there sometimes sometimes anatomical reduction is not possible 
so we have to accept the the biological reduction elastic stability and also sometimes there are some uh, non anatomical reduction in the valgus mode uh, rather than the varus mode which is much more beneficial in the long run uh, especially the osteoporotic fractures in the aged patients those who are relatively less functional demand so this is the principles of choice and sometimes we can use some biological augmentation augmentation in the in form of the bone grafts sometimes sometimes strut grafts in in the just some dispensable bones like the uh, the fibula or sometimes intermedullary some uh, some column fixation uh, both the columns that is uh, that is the uh, lateral uh, plate and some medial nail uh, elastic nail like that or additional bilateral uh, uh, both the both the columns are fixed with the uh, the plates fixation especially in the, the distal femur uh, in the proximal tibia now, so the, those were the, the long the weight bearing long bones the by both the column fixation is uh, is required you know, so this is i think uh, is absolutely covered is there any questions uh, so dr jis is there uh, any question from it. any question from the post graduate uh, students i can see few people are here if they want to ask dr jis joseph sir if they have any doubts or any other principles they can like which they would like to clear their doubts or ask ask him directly uh professor mm rai sir are you online uh i think mm rai sir some network issue is there yes yeah. another thing i i must highlight not only the fixation is important post operative rehabilitation as dr g is uh, rightly mentioned there is a range of motion exercises should be initiated in as early as possible as the pain subsides and not only that the but the medical management anti osteoporotic medical management is also mandatory and sometimes we are very much uh, keen to know the effect of periparatide the periparatide as the uh, there is um, uh, this uh, that is a, st a stimulating effect of the bone healing uh, process that can also be considered especially in, in the frail patients up even uh, even after the fixation so these are the also sometimes it is required thank you sir we have covered most of the osteoporotic uh, so the uh, principles of fixation of an osteoporotic fracture uh, i'd like to hear from anil because as students they are also uh, getting involved in this thing like what is what's the message or uh, this thing regarding the oski they would like to tell about uh, how they are approaching and how they are like uh, going to tackle after that i'll be sharing one one uh, incident regarding oski because we we didn't give oski for our uh, dnb examinations so we were once made to give an oski in uh, osmania medical college long back so i'll be sharing that experience but first i think anil can share a little bit of uh, his views thank you because both dr pal and uh, uh, uh dr pal sir as well as dr rai sir both are dnb examiners i i suppose they can give uh, the feedback to the board also regarding uh, the students approach to the oski on in yes sir nil yes sir uh, sir actually this was my first class regarding the oski so i'm not very much accustomed to it sir so slowly and gradually i will get to know about it sir Sure. So you have got a taste of uh, the. Yes, sir. This was my first. Sir, this was my first class, sir. This was yeah, my first okay. class regarding uh, the OSCE. Let me sir. let me take you back to 2012 when I was a student and first time the OSCE was held in uh, Osmania Medical College. Their uh, uh, postgraduate training program is known as HOME, H-O-M-E. Uh, so there we had some 300 delegates, all of them postgraduate students. We all appeared for the OSCE, and when the results were published. Uh, hardly three or four people got the passing marks so this is something which you the main point of stressing it is you have to take this very seriously it is not the routine clinical examination that we do and uh, you will take time to adapt to the oski that's why i asked uh, like uh, that's why just sir also asked me and we were like very keen on having an oski se session with uh, regarding this because this is the way forward for uh, the post graduate examination as as rightly said by uh, dr pal sir as well as dr jess sir the good thing is uniformity you have the uniformity in assessment which was not there in previous system so oski gives uniformity in assessment there no question of bias from the bias, no question of bias just, no confusion from the student also and like this sir so in one case card test so if you say card test you are getting half mark but 
uh, one of the resident tells it's a test for median nerve. So you are getting a minus half, but it's not like you are getting a zero mark by telling median nerve because you have already crossed one bench. So that is the way I think it's more of a sprint friendly system rather than the older examination system. Yes, sir. but yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, Dr. Jess, uh, uh, Dr. Jess Joseph, so, uh, so would you like to add something more to our uh, discussion here? Yeah, this is a very good program. Uh, I feel uh, the initiative from the West Bengal uh, Orthopedic Association. So, see, now the students have uh, doesn't have a clue about what's going to happen with those. And all of a sudden, if they go to the exam center and come across, like uh, Dr. Abhishek has said, nobody's going to know get a good mark or they are going to fail so this is an eye opener and this is such a good initiative from the office bearers making them feel that you know you know this is a working day you are everybody is so tired but still making an effort to teach them so that is really appreciable i like to really give three cheers to the thank you thank you thank you thank you, thank you sir for being here and enlightening us yeah. Thanks to Professor A.K. Palsal, Mimra Asen also. And thanks to our WBS Secretary Partho also for uh, asking every week for a PG virtual class. And thanks to Ortho TV for co-streaming our program on Ortho TV also. This program is being co-streamed on our YouTube channel on Ortho TV also. So over to you, A.K. Palsal, for vote of thanks. Oh, so it is, I am very much delighted to know uh, the that's our our successors like uh, Dr. Rajiv Raman is taking initiative to open a new horizon for our students. Now the OSCE and OSPI is going to be the future of our assessment system. And uh, I am very much delighted that uh, WBOA and uh, Dr. Partha Sharati Shotkar, uh, Dr. Rajiv Raman and several junior people uh, that uh, they are actually leading with their bat batons and uh, they are actually taking the initiative to train our new generation. So it is an excellent initiative. I think that will uh, that is uh, just ignition of the lamp, and I think uh, it is uh, the, all the all the, it is a responsible. They are actually they are increasing the responsibility of us, the senior, all the senior teachers and also the uh, faculties. And I'm also delighted uh, and special thanks to Dr. Jis. And if please come again and again in our webinar. Please join as you are very much interested in academic program also. So we will be very much uh, benefited uh, by interacting with you also. And, and prepare these uh, the, the much more questions uh, as you have prepared like the, there are several yes. texts and this. So we'll discuss in our, uh, our next WBO um, platform. And uh, this is very, uh, that will very much benefit for the student also. So, they, uh, so we are very much thankful to WBO, our uh, secretary, our beloved secretary, Partha Sharati Sharkar, and also our president, <laughs> Dr. Chinmoy, I think Dr. Chinmoy is, uh, is no, in, some network uh, issue is there, so he could network issue. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, overall, Professor M.M. M. Roy, he is actually our umbre umbrella light. He is a very, very academic person from the very beginning of my career. I am I'm, I'm visiting him so that uh, he is actually very much uh, actually devoted to propagate the knowledge and also training of the uh, of young generations. So I am very much indebted to him also. Uh, and in my life, he's also actually, he's a, he guided in several aspects. So how to learn and also how to uh, teach uh, the our next generation. So thank you, Professor M.M. Rai also. And also I'm very much uh, delighted to uh, also uh, our the students that uh, they are also taking initiatives to know and uh, this new uh, mode of assessment. Uh, thank you all. I think uh, over to Dr. Rajiv Ramon for yes. the last. Uh, Thank you, Jis sir, and uh, thank you, Avishek, for organizing this wonderful meeting. And thanks to Siddharth also and Arno, uh, who are our web moderator and who planned over everything so that the program should run smoothly. And thanks, everyone. And thanks, Jis sir. And looking forward to see you in our future meeting also yeah, for yeah. virtual class. Sure, yeah, as yeah, yeah. Pals yeah, told. Yeah. We will call you frequently. We will call you frequently. It's all all right, sir. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, sir. sir. Well done, Anil. Thank you, sir. 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 Thank you